we'll, uh, we'll get started here. And I wanted to, um, first of all, thank the library, and especially Rus Russell is here in night, uh, tonight, uh, an off night for Russell. He's helping us because Julia's out. Uh, and thank the library uh, staff for having us. And I wanted to... Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to thank you all for coming and those of you who are on Zoom. We have a healthy population on Zoom, which is great. Um, but what a week and uh, how prescient, I guess, on some level to be here. It, I was just thinking tonight before I came down, it was uh, less than five months ago, we started our first event here for Camden Can. It was in September, but it was on the eve of Hurricane Lee. And I can't believe it's just been five months because we have had so many drastic weather events in that short period of time. Uh, so I don't know about the rest of you, but today was a kind of a, okay, this is real. And it's always been real, but looking at Camden Harbor yesterday morning was um, something I never ever thought I would see. So Camden Can started because we wanted to have uh, the community have a place where we could talk about climate, talk about the climate crisis. And we felt it was time to start accepting the reality of the changing world that we're living in. Uh, and it's a grassroots organization. Uh, some of us are here tonight, the people who started it. There are many more here who are supporters of us and online and around both the town and the state. We've gotten a lot of great support. Um, we've had several panels. You can find them online if you've missed them. We had the one in September that's on the library website. We had another one early November that is on the town of Camden website and that talked uh, we had neighboring communities come talk to us about what they were doing for uh, climate change. We had one in this room early December that was about what Camden what Camden has done officially for climate work and I encourage you to look at all of those panels. We also um, have a bi weekly newsletter that we put out if you'd like to sign up for that there's a sign up for, sheet for it here. Uh, we also will be doing volunteer committees this spring, start doing some uh, policy and other work in town. But at the moment, we're just trying to have people talk about uh, climate. Uh, we also have next Thursday, what we call our climate conversations. They're held one o'clock here mm -hmm. in, the, in the picker room. Uh, they're just forums or places to come sit and talk about climate, what's going on for you personally about the climate crisis, uh, share ideas, mostly to get to know one another so we can begin to build a resilient community, people who are um, able to come together when we need one another. Uh, the other things we have coming up, we have a potluck February 22nd that will be at the Congregational Church. It's gonna be a potluck open to the whole community. We hope you come and uh, bring something and just sort of get to know people yet again. And f following on that, we'll have a night about solar and what Camden homeowners are doing for solar power. And in April, in this room, we'll, on April 4th, Carrie Emanuel, who is a professor, professor emeritus at MIT, will come and talk about coastal storms and their impact on Penobscot Bay. So we hope you'll all uh, join us for that. But most importantly, we thank you for being here tonight. And tonight we uh, are presenting a, a conversation or a chat from Parker. I'm going to let Esperanza Stancioff, who is one of my colleagues at Camden uh, Can, introduce uh, Parker. Esperanza has, is a professor emerita from the University of Maine system, has been working in the climate field and climate leadership for years. We are fortunate to have her as a Camden resident. She has helped Camden do things like the flood resilience checklist, but it's also more importantly, help us have these conversations. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Speranza Stanchioff. Thank you. Hey, Chloe. Um, I just want to acknowledge that during this last storm and probably in the next one, you know, there's a lot of people that are suffering and that have had some crises in their in their lives as a result. And I just want to acknowledge that that's happening in our community and, and beyond. Um, so achieving climate resilience in coastal communities. Dr. Parker Bassett is the Marine and Coastal Community Specialist for the Maine Climate Science Information Exchange since 2020. He has been a member of the Marine Extension Team of the Maine Sea Grant Program at the University of Maine. 
And since 2016, we have been close colleagues at the University of Maine, proudly embracing the Make It Happen Now approach to community organizing and connecting academia with community needs. For a regional campaign on ocean acidification, Parker received the 2018 Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions Award for outstanding contribution to sustainability research by a graduate student. This work continued to become his doctoral research on managing ocean climate change in the Gulf of Maine. He received the 2023 Maine Fisherman's Forum Distinguished Service Award for supporting the virtual sessions of the conference in 2021. And as most related to today's presentation, he is the co-editor and a primary author of the 2023 Maine Community Resilience Workbook. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> a framework and how to guide for the climate change assessment, collective climate action, and achieving community resilience outcomes, primarily focused on coastal <coughs> communities, no small feat. Dr. Gassett, thank you for being here this evening to share your important work with us. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, special thanks to Esperanza. You've been a a total mentor and a guide for me in this whole career. So it's a, it's quite an honor to be here from your invitation, really uniquely special. Thank you. Um, and thank you all enormously for your time tonight. Many of you are participants engaged with the Camden Can initiative and just want to recognize that there is a lot of expertise and knowledge in this room. Could be many of you who are up giving a presentation on your stories and your expertise as it relates to Camden's initiatives moving forward. And so I it's really a privilege to be here, to be invited in this way. And I also really look forward to hearing from you and, and some discussion today and moving forward in this initiative. So I'm humbled to be in this community, but but really appreciate it. So I, you know, I I think it it's it's fairly remarkable that we are here in the, the actual aftermath of an event that is in the, the scope and context of climate change. Yesterday's storm was, was truly remarkable. The coastal damage is, is actually unprecedented. So it's been, call, it's been called for by Governor Mills as of midday today as a, a civic status of emergency, which is a, you know, a unique mechanism to access federal and state funding. But, but at noontime today, the, the main Department of Marine Resources and the main emergency management agency put out a off the cuff survey to literally acquire photos and documentation of the plethora of damages across Maine's coast. So this is like a, you know, crowdsourcing, you know, what the heck happened yesterday and how bad is it? There were flights throughout today where Patrick Kelleher, the um, department lead from Maine DMR was just touring the state to see the extent of the damage along Maine's working waterfront and waterfront communities in general. Um, so this is this is not going to be a talk primarily about sea level rise and flooding. This is going to be about community resilience overall and community organizing. But I, I do just feel because it's so timely, we need to we need to kind of bring up sea level rise and flooding, at least as an intro or an entree to some of the other discussions. And I think it's particularly relevant for, for Camden's risks moving forward. And the, the evidence is just clear that the, the rate of sea level rise in Maine is accelerating. We've had record high monthly mean sea level rise for seven months in 2023. So this year alone has had seven different month sea level, mean sea level rise high records. Um, and over the past three decades, sea level rise has arisen at a rate of roughly three and a half millimeters per year. And that's a, a really a significant acceleration from the past century. Um, so this is the hockey stick kind of curve that people are starting to become familiar with, that our rate of acceleration is accelerating. What's realistically more concerning is that these levels in Maine are pretty much the standard for the entire globe for, for sea level rise. So both for the short term and the long term. So we really can't ignore this impact on our coastal areas. So, you know, we're having record breaking monthly mean water levels that are surpassing long term averages 
uh, in some locations, six to 10 inches on major storms. So looking ahead, it's, it's really crucial for us to plan and adapt to the projected increase in sea levels. And Maine's commit to manage sea level rise scenario, uh, which is based on current project projections, is set at a, a foot and a half by 2050 and just around four feet by 2100. So that's the state mandate for us to commit to manage that amount of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And that's in line with the, the latest set of recommendations from the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, it's really providing a, a roadmap for the impending crisis. So it's, it's hard to imagine that, that kind of change and what our working water fronts look like. Um, but you know, we do have projections and at this point, they're, they're feeling pretty accurate. But the gravity of that situation becomes even more apparent when we're, when we're considering the impacts of sea level rise at the end of century. So we often think of these 2100 projections and that in terms of our own narrative, that's kind of the end, that's the stopping point. But if we think about the duration of some of our longest standing buildings and historic landmarks, we're thinking about more than 100 years and the projections out past 2100 continue to grow. So we need to keep that as part of our conversation as we imagine, you know, what is the future of our community and you know, the future of our nation's coasts. Um, plus, to be frank, we kind of can't underestimate the instability of the Antarctic ice sheets, and that would add a, a whole other layer of variability in terms of what we're looking at for sea level rise. That would be an order of magnitude larger. Um, so it's pretty serious. Uh, I'll, I'll add that, that right now, specifically for the Gulf of Maine, we're actually under the influence of a, of a lunar cycle that's an 18 year lunar cycle period that over the past 20 years has dampened Maine's most extreme tides. And starting in 2024, that lunar cycle is changing. We will have more magnified lunar tide effects and <clears throat> the kind of highest impact of that is going to be mid 2030s but you know the 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 events that we saw yesterday and that we've seen increasingly over the last few years you know those are those are anomalies those are extreme and yet it is also part of this new normal in terms of what to expect for a combination of sea level rise and storm surge um so the change in climate in as far as Maine is concerned, it doesn't just bring the sea level rise, it, it brings this extreme precipitation and increased variability in weather patterns. And, you know, I, I think ironically for this past year, we do need to learn to expect both increasing drought and increasing extreme wetness. And, to, you know, the idea of preparing for both those things in tandem, I mean, this past summer felt like we were in the <clears throat> Northwest. And yet, we should still keep on the horizon that we might have extended periods of drought. Um, but the past, the past several years have really demonstrated this need for preparedness as we navigate these new climate fluctuations. Um, damaging wind and rain from storms has become such a recurring feature. I think it's really bring the the kind of lexicon of municipal budgets in terms of storm damage and replacing gravel and fixing culverts, et cetera. Um, and, and certainly in terms of just kind of popular awareness and conversational topics, I feel like the, the, the dialogue about climate change has become a little bit real, especially as it relates to really heavy storm damage. Um, you know, these powerful storms have caused widespread flooding, significant damage to our infrastructure, and in this journey towards a sustainable future, we just need to understand that heavy precipitation events are increasing. So they've increased in frequency since the 1950s. That is assuredly true. Models predict that this trend will continue. We can expect here in the, in the Northeast region, more intense rain events with a more concentrated 24 hour period of rainfall. And of course, it has profound impacts for rivers, most obvious being flood risk, but in terms of general ecology, major, major changes. So right now we've had a 19% increase in average flooding from 1966 to 2015. And the increase in precipitation, though 
isn't always directly correlated with flooding because it's a co-occurrence of snow melt and the precipitation, but for the most part, flooding is also increasing in a statistically measurable way. Um, so some of the kind of recent, this is 2019 photos of just sunny day, high tide flooding in Camden Harbor. We also need to recognize that historically, you know, flooding is not, I think, especially came gross for some of these photos down the line. Um, but, you know, flooding happens in river systems. So in, in a conversation that is saying, you know, this is unprecedented or the level of flooding is unprecedented, part of what is indicated in that is the frequency of reoccurrence of this kind of 100-year flood or 500-year flood. The frequency of those things happening is also what's unprecedented. This is 1915 with the, the Moulton Street Dam. Uh, this is the tannery lot, which at the time was a woolen company, um, but that just water, you know, flowing through this whole area. This is a few years ago that Ken Gross and I walked through some of the library archives of these photos. Um, so in, in this context, you know, sea level rise and flooding and myriad other climate impacts. And this will be a segue to the actual purpose of today's talk. It just the role of community organizations to lead change and to support municipal progress cannot be overstated. So I, I hope that my remarks throughout, throughout this talk are, are kind of helpful for the Camden Can Initiative. I, I recognize that there is, there is great skill and ambition within this group. Uh, it's rapidly maturing you know, a series of initiatives within Camden Can. Um, and you know, up front, I'll say that if there are things that are lacking this presentation, I look forward to filling those gaps by you know, continuing to work with the group. So this presentation really is for people who are thinking about participating in Camden Can and, and getting involved, uh, recognizing that there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. So in this talk, I'm gonna walk through community-wide responses to climate change. I'll describe aspects of community organizing that can kind of align a really diverse aspect of a climate portfolio. You'll learn about a number of resources that ideally are gonna save Camden Can money and save you time, kind of expediting that, that process of information to action. Uh, I'll comment on integrating different activities for, for better outcomes and kind of broadening that pool of participation. We'll explore how communities can access technical assistance. Um, you'll learn about some financial opportunities currently on the table that are unique to Maine and, and beyond. And then also we'll, we'll discuss some professional development opportunities for kind of individual champions in the community that are saying, you know, I, I think we have what it takes. I just want to get a little bit more integrated with the with a professional network so that I at a local level can kind of be the you know, one of the people connecting the dots. So that's the goal of today. I, I kind of want to kick it off with um, defining some some pre-related concepts, and, and it's the the difference and similarity between adaptation and resilience. And I, I think of adaptation as those are the the actual actions or the steps or the interventions that you might make as a community, but resilience is your is your ability collectively to be brainstorming those and putting them into practice. So, you know, this kind of meeting and the forums of people getting together and the dialogues that continue from them, that's really something about building resilience. The, the particular interventions that are chosen you know, across different aspects of the town. Those might be individual adaptations. Um, but they're, of course, corresponding and interrelated concepts, but, but really important when, when, you know, half the group is saying, let's do something now. We want to act, we want to do something now. And part of the group is saying, you know, let's come together and have a dialogue. Those are mutually reinforcing concepts, but, but different. So if we think of you know, downtown Camden, this, is, this was last year when the pier got totally ripped up and you know excavator there that was being rebuilt 
you might think of adaptation being okay we're going to build some strong uh, you know a stronger waterfront or we're going to use composite materials that can be more easily uh, taken apart disassembled and reassembled because we know this is going to happen again or we're going to use a design that allows for water to flow through because we know that we're going to hit high tides like this again and, and storm surge like this those might be individual adaptations whereas components of Camden's resilience might be, we're gonna have more community-wide dialogue or the business owners that are you know, most impacted are gonna to come together and we're gonna start planning together about this or improve our forecasting ability to know when this is gonna happen, et cetera. So those would be the components of resilience, just as examples. And to my knowledge, that actually started happening. A lot of the businesses downtown, like right around this area, are meeting frequently with the harbor master, doing quite a bit of sea level rise and storm surge planning. So that's an element of their, you know, building resilience as a pocket community within this larger, larger context. So where's Camden at right now? Um, there's been quite a few steps. You know, I, I think we're at a, a particularly exciting and motivated time of integrating Camden's climate vision with a broader sustainability vision. But just to point back to some things that are already working really well, Camden's comprehensive plan has super ambitious sustainability targets. And a lot of work has gone into that. And it's a 2017 publication. I think the requirement is that it's decadal, so not till 2027 for the update. But there's some significant planning for sustainability within the existing comprehensive plan. There's a Pretty deep dive into waterfront resilience from the wood consulting group that was paid for by Department of Marine Resources, I think in 2017. The Island Institute was very involved in specifically around Camden's working waterfront and kind of what this future looks like in sea level rise scenarios and what can be done. And then shout out to the watershed school for putting together, starting in 2016, just a, a a series of really ahead of their time reports on Camden's greenhouse gas inventory, what it would take to decarbonize public facilities in the town, uh, what it would require for sea level rise plans, and then action steps for a full climate action plan, you know, as recommended by the students and teachers of the watershed school. So really amazing scaffold for some big ideas. The ideas are easy to come up with. Right, it's the next step that takes requires the community organizing. But just to point out, you know, each of these documents represents a layer of organization and bringing people together and scoping that has you know real people involved. So there's a community behind each one of these efforts, much like you know the products and services of Camden Can is representative of all the people who've been involved. I will say, if any of this is immediately starting to bore you, just feel free to go to sleep. It's nice and <laughs> dark back here. So the plans, you know, the plans aren't everything. The plan is just the document. Ideally, it's being put into action. But just to, to mention, you know, that very few times is there a single manifesto that's going to do it all. These are integrated parts, you know, so aspects of Camden zoning should be related to the sustainability plan is related to the general plan. So just to show like, you know, in this reality that a lot of times the documents are kind of the, the breadcrumb trail of how people have been involved, it's okay that there's lots of things like this. That doesn't mean that we're, you know, re recreating the wheel every time. It doesn't mean we're always duplicating efforts. Think of this as like the redundancy that's necessary oftentimes to make sure everything is clicking together, as long as the plan isn't the overall goal. You know, the goal isn't just the document or the report. So, yeah, I think I've commented on that. Um, I just want to make some comments on other examples that could really be useful as we think about, you know, the, the broad spectrum of climate hazards and where we begin that across the state for primarily coastal communities, but coastal and England, Bangor has a climate action plan, Bar Harbor has a climate action plan, Bath has a climate action plan, Belfast has a kind of climate crisis report. 
Biddeford Climate Action Plan, Blue Hill has a sea level rise, very thorough report. Booth Bay Harbor has a flood impact study. Bodenham, whole section within its comp plan. Brunswick, Shabig, both have vulnerability assessments to climate change. Cumberland, Falmouth, Freeport, Georgetown, and Harpswell all have sustainability plans that incorporate climate change. Islesboro has a flood vulnerability assessment for its primarily its transportation system, but some of it is island wide. Kennebunk and Kennebunkport. Lemoyne has a transportation vulnerability report. Lincolnville has a report specific to the pier and the ferry terminal. I'm kind of interested to see how much of yesterday was like absolutely forecasted in this 2018 Lincolnville pier vulnerability assessment. Um, Machias has flood resilience plans. MDI has its own climate action plan. Phippsburg has a sea level rise vulnerability assessment. Portland and South Portland. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I, it, it's valuable <laughs> to know that there are examples, you know, there is no such thing as plagiarism when it comes to a community developing good ideas for its sustainability. <clears throat> Scarborough has a sustainability plan. Stonington has an adaptation report. Topsom has a climate action plan. Vinyl Haven has its resiliency report. Wells and York both have reports that are called tides, taxes, and new tactics, for how they're going to fund municipal government in the reality of sea level rise. Um, and Yarmouth is working on a climate action plan now. So of course, every town is unique. But when you start to dive in <laughs> to some of the details of these plans, a lot of it's pretty similar. But a real holdup is that a group like Camden Can will get together and will say, Jesus, the scope of our initiative is enormous. Where do we start? Well, we need some kind of strategic guide to help people work forward. You get a lot of enthusiasm. People will produce some kind of strategy. But that alone kind of like burns up the fuel in the fire. And so let's not make the writing of the strategic report where everybody's energy goes and is used up. You know, let's use what's out there so that the community can be more community engaged in, in things that are really about the face to face interactions and bringing people together and getting that energy and getting that, you know, real collective action, rather than getting people together and creating a big homework assignment for everyone to do, you know, like, let's, let's do that part quickly and efficiently, so that we can do more of the community organizing um, and have more fun with it, bring people together in a more uh, civic engaged way. Um, so typically when a, when a climate change uh, or, or when a public official in a municipality or a group is asked about climate change and what's going on with the town or a group is first organizing around climate change in their town, the answer is we haven't, we haven't done anything. We're starting from scratch. This is like the first time we've done any of it you know that's really common like we're just keeping up with the day to day we're just keeping up with fixing the potholes keeping the lights on right and then as that conversation deepens it's very quickly realized that the the typical responsibilities of town government and community groups that already exist powerfully overlap over overlap all of these concerns of climate change Right, we have a lot of the ingredients already working for it. between the responsibilities of public works department what's going on with the town conservation commission what's happening with the emergency management agency at the town or the county level. You know all of these all of these parts there's no czar of climate change and yet each of these different groups, you know, you would know this, this i'm not saying anything new but. The components of climate action are already baked in to so many of the things that community members are doing. The real heavy lift is how do we how do we increase the communication and the alignment across these disparate groups that have had typically separate distinct functions so that we can do more with what's already happening. Because you know we're not exactly keeping pace with climate adaptation. So that's really fundamentally different than saying we have nothing going for us we're starting from scratch instead it's we have a lot of ingredients and we haven't yet put together the meal of you know how we're going to bring this thing into something that's we really be proud of as a community 
And so once you've kind of evaluated that different task, I think the, the role of community groups that are really impassioned about climate change, I think it allows you to be more focused on what is possible, right? Recognizing how much is already going on. Um, you know, as community leaders and public officials establish climate initiatives, they create goals, they develop plans, they engage greater depth on topics, resilience and adaptation and climate hazard mitigation, all of this acknowledges that that's just a part of good governance. You know, that's not even many of the tactics, they're not even climate change specific. They're just good civic engagement, just good forms of governance. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask all of these existing positions to suddenly be climate change experts. You know, that's a tall order. And so we need to keep the expectations re realistic and reasonable. I think this is what I'm going to introduce that as a, as a community across Maine, we recognize how much of a lift that is to suddenly say, oh, and your job is also to deal with climate change on top of everything else. And so to, to kind of make that a lighter lift, we put together, to our knowledge, the book of like everything that's happening in Maine right now on climate. Who's doing what, where they are, what are the example interventions, what are the kinds of guiding questions that can help you to have community meetings where essentially the same comment as before, spend less time doing the homework part of it and more time doing the community organizing and building connections and friendships and relationships between different people who are acting in the climate space. And one of the things that we produced in this, this is called the, the Main Community Resilience Workbook. Um, I know Camden can and the town of Camden have, have hard copies. Um, but one of the things that we put together is just like a conceptual framework to help people recognize that there are you know, different parts of this. I'm not, I, I don't think I need to walk through the text of each slide, but, but there, there's a reinforcing process of what resilience building looks like and what those specific adaptation look like. There's a framework that allows them to be connected and, you know, you can enter this cycle at any stage, but I often think of like, consider community and landscape. You know, if we're in the context of Camden, it's like, what do people in Camden care about? What are our economic engines? You know, what's the, what's the, what's the actual landscape of organizations and people and activities that are involved, right? That's that first part of it. And now what are the risks to life as usual? You know, if we want to maintain our same quality of life in Canada, what are those risks? You know, storms and, and coastal flooding being one of them, but you know, high heat being one of them for Camden's walkability in downtown. I know, Beattie, you've been such a champion of planting shade trees and you know, getting more vegetation and, and others in the room as well. Um, you know, so what are our risks as they relate to climate change? And there's a lot of overlapping risks. I mean, just as a, as a, I think a foray into a slightly different topic, but there's the direct impacts of climate change in terms of our, our climatology and what those impacts are. And then there's the secondary reality that a lot of people are moving to Maine because we're in a better position than the panhandle right now. You know, and so like, what does uh, urbanization of Camden and more people moving here, what does climate migration look like for Maine? Those kinds of secondary knock-on effects of climate change are also part of this, like we'll assess the risks and opportunities just to be honest in terms of the economic perspective for some things. Um, at that point, you know, your next part of the cycle is to make a plan. We got a lot of evidence of that for particular sectors. There's lots of support to do that kind of stuff. Um, implementing the projects is usually where people are saying, hurry it up, let's, let's make it happen now. But to recognize that that you know that actual shovel in the ground aspect of building resilience and adapting to climate change, you know that's just one part of the whole cycle. And I, I think again I'll make the point that this could be the case for just governance and tackling society's issues in general. In this case, the terminology is climate specific, but this is just society responding to change. Okay. <laughs>
I'll try to find where I am in my notes. Just one more. Uh, let's move on to some specific resources. This is where, for for some of you that are note takers, you might be in the flurry. You don't have to do that. We can. All of it is found in in this workbook. We can get you a link. Uh, it's all online as well. Um, but just to walk through. For almost any kind of data that you might have a question about, there has been some agency or organization in Maine that has tried to put together that kind of data, almost inevitably. So not all questions are answered, but there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there. So just to walk through some of the tools that might save this group money. Maine Flood Resilience Checklist, Camden's actually gone through this. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but an excellent tool for just like the inventory of flood risk and flood considerations to be considered and for prime for a community dialogue. Um, flood mapping is really articulated by FEMA. There's a main emergency management agency that's very helpful with specific flood mapping and understanding flood insurance rates, the best flood forecast as well. Um, Maine Geological Survey has not only sea level rise mapping tools, but also storm surge mapping tools, the erodibility of different shorelines for river and coastal, um, so tons of geographical information that's all there in terms of, in terms of um, thinking about sea level rise and climate change. Uh, think about marsh migration, mapping layers for this. Mapping layers for habitat conservation and habitat corridors in general. Uh, inventories of main conserved lands. So as you think about like, oh, okay, if we're gonna make a case to the planning board or try to get something on the ballot, we really need to have the, you know, the shiny thing in hand to make the point to prove the thing that this is a really good idea. All of those mapping layers exist, you know, and so use those, use those things, you know, rather than seeking right off the bat seeking consultants to, to do things for your town. Ecological connectivity maps that are specific to Maine. Maine DOT has an inventory of roads and culverts, their, their elevation above current sea level, their elevation above projected sea level, their current condition, the assessment of all of that kind of infrastructure. The Nature Conservancy put together a coastal resilience mapping tool that is both social resilience like the community and the population based on demographic information um, as well as actual you know, physical climate risk uh, they've also put that tool together specific to sea level rise you know separate from other climate impacts uh, there's a weathering main uh, app that's talking about extreme storms and storm impacts the Climate Reanalyzer is a tool from the University of Maine that gives you forecasts for what Maine's climate will look like, compares it to other states at different you know, decadal intervals, so you can really get a more intuitive sense as to what is to be expected for Maine. This is an internationally renowned tool that was just built here in Maine. Um, only three years ago, the Maine Climate Council uh, commissioned a, a full state scientific and technical report of all the climate impacts expected for, for the state over the next 100 years. And it, it categorically inventories different climate hazards. It's a deep, dry read, but everything that you want is there. <laughs> um, the New England Environmental Finance Center is, is our region's environmental finance center. Uh, they have done an, an extensive job of recommending financial guidance for communities who are dealing with likely climate impacts and then the secondary impacts of like the coastal homeowners are no longer contributing to property tax revenue. What do you do about that? So kind of the real economic planning around this, this kind of guidance exists. Stormwater management, there are extensive guides for how to retrofit existing municipal stormwater systems. The excellent professional development for public works staff in particular. Um, there's, there's a full infrastructure planning toolbox that was made by a series of main agencies and, and NGOs talking specifically really about like pipes in the ground and pavement on the road. So all this just to say these and more like these layers exist, 
the goal of when you're when you're tasking people to get involved ideally you're not spending hours and hours and hours just digging through all the products that's the point of this this kind of resource is just to save you time in getting to these things just want to retrofit manual okay um yeah just to just to illustrate um how much is out there so many organizations Tackled with the same question of how are we going to make a difference? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of a lot. But I will say, that, like, there have been so many organizations in Maine that have said, okay, we've got we got this two-year project, we've got a budget, we've got amazing expert staff. What do we what do we do? Well, it probably can't just work with one community. The impact might be too small. We'd like something that scales up. Well, we can't work with every community in Maine. Okay, we'll make a tool that they can use. We'll make a, you know, a guidance document or a, something that can really scale up for everyone else to use. They make the tool and there's no apprenticeship. You know, the tool just lives there in the toolbox and Maine's toolbox isn't, it's like Liberty Tools right now. I mean, there's, it's, everything is there, but there's, there's a, a lack of training and hands-on time to get those really into the right application. And it's, you know, you can't just have the hammer, you need, you know, you need the people to come together to actually put it into place, to do the organizing, to do the networking, to do these kinds of events, to make that kind of geographical information relevant and meaningful for people to make a real change in their community. So that's, this is, this is really trying to save you time. Um, right. The, the tool bag is not the project. The fact that this, that the information lives out there somewhere, that does not mean that change is happening here in Camden. That takes you all in the room. Um, I don't, I think this is, this is just conceptually to say that what can drive, what can drive a commitment to being climate resilient? It can start in the middle with a specific project, right? Like right now, the community is clearly really grappling with how to respond and interact with Montgomery Dam. So that specific project is the seed of a snowflake for conversations about, well, what does climate resilience look like for this specific project? You know, what does ecological resilience look like when we're thinking about the specific project, right? That can be the origination of how we integrate climate change. Or on the outermost part of this circle, we, you know, the first page of the comprehensive plan in Camden says Camden will be the most sustainable coastal town in Maine. That's what it says on the first page, right? So that broad community vision, that can say, okay, within that broad vision, climate change is a part of what that looks like, and here's how we're going to get there. Or it can be really specific things like, wow, funding is available for this one type of thing. Let's get an EV school bus. There's cash available for EV school, but let's do that. You know, it can be opportunistic like that. Any of those things are great. Take, take it all, take any, any on-ramp to do climate adaptation is the right one. So just some examples uh, from projects in, in Camden, and I know that there are many, so these are just a little bit. Uh, a really extensive effort a couple of years ago to map Camden's stormwater system. It involved Bowdoin College students. It's led to a whole GIS series of layers, looking at, you know, where do the pipes go? Like, on a big storm, this is like the last thing I'm thinking. And I'm in this field, but like, leaves clogging gutters, clogging manholes, filling up pipes, filling up with sediment. You know, the infrastructure, the underground piping of Camden is a huge part of how ready we are for major storms. And it's not, very glorious or easy to figure out what's going on down there. Right? So mm -hmm. just to be um, another project that had, I think also, also a Bowdoin College student yeah. Yeah. Um, was just mapping Camden's impervious surfaces, right? This is a conversation that's just as much about gardeners with rain barrels as it is ordinances around parking lots, right? And so thinking about, you know, is Camden a sponge or are we, you know, a funnel for water to get into the places where it's problematic. Um, 
Shout out to some of the people in the room. Uh, Camden Street Trees Project, the you know the the ginkgo trees that showed up in the sidewalk, things like that appear. There's a whole story behind projects like that. It's not you know just it, it doesn't just happen. You know the, these are a part of conversation. So this you know originally the funding to put in ginkgo trees was climate funding that got you know steered towards let's do more green infrastructure in Camden um, and put in more trees. And now, gosh, look at like across from Hanford, the number of trees that put, put in, it's like, a, it's a whole thing. There's a huge motivated campaign for street trees in Camden, it's amazing. I don't know the extent of who all has been involved. Going back to the flood resilience checklist, this is in 2021 that um, pretty much all the town department heads got together and walked through this risk assessment for flooding. So, you know, a remarkable showing of people getting involved. I do notice that there's no, you know, like where are just the community representatives in this group? You know, there might be things happening in Camden that are not inherently an open door policy for the rest of the community. And changing that could be a part of how Camden pursues its community resilience, its form of being more open and responsive and creative in implementing solutions to climate change and doing so efficiently and you know, expeditiously. But these things are happening. You know, like the, the, this is on the radar of people who are in leadership roles in the town, assuredly. Let's hit those. Uh, working with the with the county level emergency management agency, Camden has at this point pretty well designed visual maps of all of its sea level rise scenarios. I've never seen these on posters downtown, but the county has all these products. You know, this has been developed through requests from the town, and you know, in, in this case. I'll just point out these numbers. 1.6 feet above astronomical high tide, that is the, the state's mandate to commit to manage to that amount of sea level rise by the year 2050. 3.9 is commit to manage by 2100. And 8.8 .8 feet is the, the global worst case scenario for 2100, just to keep it within, keep in the concept that these two numbers our middle of the road forecasts for sea level rise projections. And commit to manage means that if you're getting state funding for a project or aim to boost a project with any state funding, you need to demonstrate that the infrastructure you're building is tolerant of 1.6 feet if the lifespan of that infrastructure is to 2050 and to 3.9 feet of sea level rise if the lifespan is to 2100. So, right, this there's like, there's real teeth in those projections. And in the past two years, it's caused the Department of Environmental Protection and the main Department of the Marine Resources to just fully reevaluate the laws that they have on the books to make sure that they are aligned with that mandate for the state. So um, some comments on coordination. I'm gonna catch up with my notes as well. How much time do we have now? Um, we have 10 minutes, yeah. nine minutes to go. it. Um, way too much to go through for time. <laughs> okay, so just some examples, I think maybe as just a slide to share with you both later on. These are examples of different multi-town endeavors. So if Camden's thinking about doing a project with Rockport or maybe with Lincolnville and Rockport or any of our neighbors, um, there are some great examples of what that looks like statewide. Probably a lot of the hiccups have already been solved elsewhere. There are tons of non-governmental organization partners throughout Maine who, to be honest, are pretty eager to have place-based projects. They have the staff, they're really adept at getting funding. Um, so to consider like reaching out and sort of partner with some of these organizations can be really effective. In general, as you know, as you think of well, what's the role of Camden Can, I really want to encourage that these two things are really different. Don't accidentally become a bottleneck 
where all climate projects have to be through the filter of Camden Can in order to be important or real. Be a megaphone of what those things are. Celebrate what those things are. Because if you really want to scale, it can't be a se sequential step to go through a filter process for everything. Because the purpose is to integrate all of our climate adaptation steps across all of the activities. That's too big for one organization. But one organization can be a megaphone of what those things are. So think about that analogy and, and kind of choose when to encourage or when to be involved or when to say no, and try not to say no very often. Um, as, as one aside, there's, there's also a new resource for the state that I'm particularly proud of. And it's about, it's about helping people to see what climate expert, what disciplinary climate expertise is within the state. So within the research community and academic community that's focused on climate change, there's a new office that's available to make that information more available. Think of it as a, a front desk of who's doing what on climate research statewide. This is the main climate science information exchange. And as a part of this office, there's now a full inventory of what climate research projects are happening right now so that you can connect with some of those experts if you have a question about stormwater or if you want to partner with someone about shade trees or something like that. And so that way, you know, A, you could possibly bring someone on board who is an academic of the discipline that you're working on. But it also gives you access to the reality that academic funding is bountiful. So the moment that a community-based project is linked with someone who's kind of in the scholarly world, you get access to all these other grants that would otherwise be unseen from a municipal or community context. So there's a lot of strategy in having academic partners and bringing on board students with projects because it can come with pretty deep pockets at time and, and it adds capacity to what can't be done at the local level. Is that also in that book? It is, it is. Um, I think for time, I'll just say that there are a lot of main specific programs that are just about climate change. Um, there's a there's kind of a cheat sheet inventory. I'll, I'll just walk through these quickly um, just to use up the slides. But there's like there's 75 different climate specific grants in Maine, and those are just the grants specific to Maine. As soon as you start to look at different grants inventories that are nationwide, there is there is a ton of funding. Anyone who's been involved in grant writing knows that it is a huge hurdle to do the grant writing process. But once you've done one, you learn that a third of what you wrote for that one is good for the next one. Once you've done two, you know that you're halfway there. And that, you know, the, you know, the opposite of diminishing returns. So if you can, as a community, start to share what have we gone after for grants and keep that in the same place, and maybe consider hiring a part-time grant writer shared with Rockport or shared with Lincolnville, suddenly your access to funding is, is really quick because there is a lot out there. And, and to be honest, the steps to get there appear intimidating and actually aren't so bad. Um, to talk about some professional development for those who are like really interested in being a part of Cam, Camden Can and want to, you know, dive deeper in, into this way, or maybe make it a profession if that's the direction you want to go. Um, there, there's an annual series of conferences and workshops in Maine that are totally accessible to you. There's an annual Better Safe Than Sorry workshop series. Um, those have all been documented in addition to the convenings that they have each year. The Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission has annual focus groups mm -hmm. and, and a series of kind of professional development opportunities. Casco Bay, you'll notice there's kind of a theme of Southern Maine. To be, there's a lot of things in Southern Maine that are ahead of what's happening in Mid-Coast and Down East. Um, Casco Bay Academy has a training series. Uh, our own Island Institute based in Rockland. Um, tons of events about <clears throat> professional development. There's a coastal training program at the Wells Reserve, uh, which is equipping you with certified skills through the NOAA office. Um, 
a series of other conferences. One that's uh, two conferences that are coming up is the Maine Sustainability and Water Conference held in Augusta each year, and the Beaches Conference held usually in Kennebunk each year, um, and, a, and a series of other forums. And then also, uh, as you get more sector based, there are meetings that are also more open to public participation than people realize. So a number of events hosted by regional planning organizations that you can attend, county level emergency management agencies host different workshops that you can often attend. There's a municipal sustainability network, the list goes on. So in the sense of, you know, if, if you are feeling motivated to contribute more and want to enter some of these professional networks around climate preparedness, it's more easy than you would think. So I want to say thank you for your time. <laughs> Okay. And hopefully we do have time for questions and ideally also, uh, you know, a bit of a bit of a dialogue because I know people are coming with a lot of their own expertise as well. So we it doesn't have, have to be minutes. a few minutes. Yeah. Anybody Thanks. have questions? Other questions? I have a comment. Love it. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank you for uh, the redundancy thing that you talked about because that is something I've worried about so much. <clears throat> that there's all these groups doing all these different things. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got energy. Are we dissipating that energy into all these different committees? And um, so what you said uh, has relaxed me. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions online? Just one about okay. whether the slides will be available after the presentation. Yeah. Sure. So I don't know how we'll do that for the recording. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, please. Um, I have a quick technical question. On the sea level rise figure mm -hmm. that the state uses, what's your base? What is the base for the astronomical time? I think it's 1992 is what the state has opted as the base, but it's somewhere kind of in recent. It's just a one year base that they pick. Yeah, the and then the client, the period, okay. and you know, this is admittedly not exactly in my niche, but I think the climatology period is either a 30 or a 40 year term to match NOAA's definitions of climatology. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about that that has used, you know, when they back calculated. I can find out more detail on that too. Do you have a follow up on that or other? Well, no, I just, it strikes me as significant because I would have already thought you had some, something you'd measure in inches at mm -hmm. least uh, from, right, from when? 30 years ago. Right. right. <laughs> For example. <clears throat> Right. So it's not like you're measuring from today, you're measuring one foot. Right. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're measuring from way back. So you're actually only adding six inches onto today. Or 12. Right. You know, it, it's a kind of, it, it just seems important to me as you think about this, because we have, we know this in this town, you just right. know where the water shows right. up and where it used to show up that we've had. Right, you can't have a shifting baseline, and I know they have a really specific baseline. Can't recall exactly what it is, but but I think that ninety two makes a thirty year period from the 22, 2022 assessment. I think it's that. It's in the main one. It's in the main one. Yeah. 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 BD and then. Well, I I just uh, well, three or four years ago, one of that I was trying to do a sort of update from the natural history that I did. I was really looking for temperatures and ran into this 30 year thing and it was hopeless because everything's ex accelerating so all of these measurements need to be on a different scale and indicate accelerating although i realize it doesn't accelerate evenly but but 30 years the work hanging out mm -hmm. and I, I would say that that kind of feedback like if from your own application like you're revising the book that you wrote and you want to change you know what the reference is yeah. like our our state climatologist sean burkle is super open to these kinds of suggestions and needs the feedback for like what what is the form of packaging because the data is there in terms of parsing it out 
based on different time period or in what scale or what unit of measurement. It's there. It's just a packaging question for the climatology office. And so, you know, happy to talk with you more and relay that info to, to Sean, of course. Um, I'm, I'm used to um, not working on this end of climate change. I'm used to working more on the prevention end. So sure. I'm like not familiar with what the thinking is around um, when you're when you're talking about adaptation and resilience and what like I don't know how to form or visualize the goal of any given campaign for resilience and adaptation like it is it like setting up structures that are like on an ongoing basis adapting or is it um, thinking that you can somehow put in place infrastructure that is um, eternally resilient and I mean or whatever like is there a standard um, framework for what we mean by successful adaptation and resilience implementation that is, is a great it's a really great question because in the mitigation world it's like our goal is neutrality our goal is zero our goal is this many heat pumps the numerical indicators of those types of aspects of mitigation are in, amazingly helpful in reaching those goals and so that quest for indicators and evaluative metrics for community resilience is absolutely underway at the state level because deciding on what there are there is the fodder of many of those types of frameworks but deciding which which actual indicators will ultimately become a part of what the state uses and thus agencies and then towns are evaluated the decision on which one to use does have a lot of implications, a lot of unintended consequences when you're deciding what to be measured. And so as a as a comment that we're in the progress of that, the state of Maine has an equity subcommittee as a part of the Climate Council, and they, along with a series of working groups for the Climate Council, are in this session working on developing resilience indicators. And so there is there is a pretty ex extensive tool that was developed by University of Maine that is um, climate adaptation and resilience metrics for evaluation that gives a walkthrough of what towns could opt for, which I think for a community level is totally adequate right now for the sparking dialogue. Is that um, the 75 steps? It's not. It's okay. separate from the community resilience partnership. Um, but, but those are available, it's called the carrot tool. Um, but the state has yet to choose a specific series of community resilience indicators. And you know, I, I think your point stands that eventually deciding that will actually be helpful, even as, as challenging as it is, because these are inherently more complex than counting carbon atoms. It, it seems to me that, that your wheel sets up a basis for indicators that would be uh, location specific, mm -hmm. which would, might be more helpful than a generic approach. Well, I, I love it. I mean, if it works for Kim, then yeah. We do have a question uh, online. That was a fantastic presentation, Parker. Thank you so much. In your, in your opinion, what is the best way to involve folks who really do care about this and want to be part of their climate action in their community, but who feel they don't have enough time to be a part of an organization or committee or go to meetings, etc. <laughs> no, I, I love it. I um, I think there's a real hurdle right now that if we think of okay, I really want to get involved in in the community's response to climate change. For some reason, the next imagination is that we're doing meetings and zoom calls and paperwork and things that aren't inherently that human at all you know and so i do think we need to get more creative to make to make these kinds of you know of of civic engagement and community organizing and collective action we need to make this this these kinds of activities like fun like bring them back to the community barn raising version and, and and a little bit of that is naive because there's a part of our world right now that's very technocratic around dealing with this and you know the the importance of policy and legal change 
and you know ordinance and zoning language and like there is a fundamental like legalese and technical aspect of many of the forms of of power in our society and you know that's that's not a bad thing but it's not accessible for all people and so if we do want to have a more democratic collective action version of getting involved with climate change i think i think there's room outside of the box for different kinds of organizing you know, I, I welcome that i'd say that you know if 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 you haven't yet been going to the to the uh the climate happy hour sessions i think they're starting to do some really creative work around here they i think they have monthly meetings um but there's but they're not meetings they're happy hour session you know so but i think i think it's a great question there's no one to answer i have a question well, you have a question right oh just a quick one uh when you mentioned like by year 2100 8.1 i think foot rise mm -hmm. in sea level along the main coast how does that equate to how much of the coastline is going to be not habitable anymore? Has anybody done a study of that? Um, assuredly, yes. Right. I, I don't know in yet. terms of acreage or number of households right. affected, yeah. um, but part of the projections are that, it, you know, the International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, We'll, we'll put together the forecast, which is a combination of their, the best global scientists that are able to agree upon you know, what we think it is. That crystal ball is inherently influenced by what we do today and tomorrow and the next year. And so any of those kinds of graphs look like a fan that's fanning out with a, with a likeliness factor that is the middle of that fan. And so it, the number that, you're, that you quoted earlier is that in the latest round of projections, a worst case scenario, which is, you know, our, which is our business as usual, no mitigation of climate emissions, that scenario would put us at 8.8 .8 feet of sea level rise by 2100. But we're all trying to bend that curve in a direction that's more sustainable for society. Um, but, but your question on what that looks like, I'd point you towards the Maine Geological Survey has a flood inundation tool mm -hmm. that you can toggle it to be 8.8 .8 feet and mm -hmm. look visually across the entire map of Maine and say, okay, those are the houses. Yeah. I, or businesses. Or businesses, right. And so that, that mapping tool isn't at the parcel scale, but if you're looking at a specific space, you can easily ask the, answer that question. So Maine Geological Survey's uh, sea level rise tool. Well, it seems to me that a lot of places man has built along the coast that are not going to be able to be protected. Have yeah. there been any funds started for acquisition of buying back buildings, properties? Like Lincoln Build Beach, I just look at that and I say, yeah. you right. can't protect yeah. that. Yeah. Someone's yeah. going to have to buy all that stuff up and turn it back to natural. Yeah. So the this like getting out of harm's way or buybacks after damage. Um, there are conversations, there's no fund yet to do that in Maine. There are example funds like that in California and Florida. Um, there are examples within FEMA's insurance program where after you have a certain number of repeat damage and claims from the insurance company, then you have the possibility of doing you know, a purchase. Um, it certainly is going to be a conversation. It's been put as a as a priority topic for the Community Resilience Working Group of the Climate Council, which is in its current session this year through November of this year. Um, that question of resilient relocation or, you know, like buyouts. Um, but there, to my knowledge, there's not yet a fund specifically in Maine to do that. It's a really tough question at scale um, because coastal properties, have a price tag. Well, it seems like Camden business area around the harbor. The Bayview Street was basically filled in. People built built there. Mm -hmm. Are the property owners going to be the ones responsible to raise that up? Because it's going to have to go up. It, it's, it's the it's financial. Build the big walls. So you right, can't right. see the harbor anymore. Plus, <laughs> a lot of equity implications if the predominant amount of infrastructure funds are going to protect protect the wealthiest coastal homeowners 
there are other questions of whether that is an appropriate responsible use of limited funds and so you're tapping into like the thorn in the side of a lot of like rebuilding a five times houses that have been torn down on beaches down south why do that yeah, that's a big question. Thank you all. So, so thank you.